So I'm calling this meeting to order. Okay, so we're doing roll call for planning commission. We have Powers. Here. Claire. Coffee. You're muted, Mary. Here. Privet. Present. Hinkle. Here. Hi, Smith. Here. Pennington. Here. Cravens. Present. LaForge. Present. So we have staff, Mr. Jeff Butler. Here, present. And municipal counselor, Susan Randall. Then are you available to give roll call? Yeah. I, I'm here, Susan. Hey, Ms. Powers, we have a quorum. All right, so um, it, it occurs to me suddenly that I do not have a list of people who have been signed up to speak. I mean, I have the list of applicants, but if there are other people who have signed up to speak, I have only a notation of protest on item number 15. Are there other persons who have signed up to speak? And is there such a list somewhere? Yes, uh, Janice, I was told that you had it, but let me forward it to you. Uh, I have it. It'll come through your email momentarily. Okay, thank you. While we're waiting, shall we uh, plunge ahead with um, the order of business that we have, uh, a, a receipt of the minutes? If you're looking for a, uh, a motion, Chair, I'll make a motion to receive the minutes. Um, I, I'm sorry, yes, I am looking for that. Yeah. The April 9th, 2020 Planning Commission meeting. Second. Second the motion. So I have a motion and a second to receive the minutes of the April 9th, 2020 Planning Commission meeting. Um, would you call the roll, please? Powers. Yes. Claire. Coffee. Yes. Privet. Privet. Aye. Sorry. Pinkle. Aye. Hi, Smith. Aye. Pennington. Aye. Ravens. Aye. LaForge. Aye. Okay, next item is our uncontested continuances. We have um, item, we have two uncontested requests. Item 17 uh, has been deferred to October 22nd and item 18 has been withdrawn. I'll take a motion on those. I have a, this is Commissioner Coffey, I have an additional item to request continuance. It's item number six, PC. Let's, let's do that under, um, let's do that under new requests. Okay, I'm sorry. Motion to so uh, continue items. Requests.
Uh, I'll second Privet's motion. I have a motion and a second to continue items 17 and 18. Call the roll, please. Powers? Yes. Coffee? Yes. Privet? Aye. Pinkle? Aye. Weston? Aye. Kennington? Aye. Craven? Aye. LaFord? Aye. So new requests, Mr. Uh, Coffey? Under new request, item six, um, PC 10653. I've spoken to the applicant this morning and we would like a uh, continuance requested on that item. Um, is there anyone who wants to speak on this item? If not, I'll take a motion. I so move. Second. Second. I have a motion and a second to continue item number six. Call the roll, please. Powers? Yes. Coffee? Yes. Privet? Aye. Hinkle? Aye. Guy Smith? Aye. Kennington? Aye. Cravens? What is the date of the continuance? I'm sorry, good for you. I thought she said until the next meeting. That's Can we correct. just confirm that date for the record? Uh, it's May the 14th. Aye. LaForge? Aye. Okay, all approved. So the uh, next item is the consent docket. We have three items today. The first is E10657, an application to rezone 3701 Northwest 192nd Street from PUD 1686 to R1. The second is C7157, a final plat of Ann Arbor Village located north of South or Northwest 23rd Street and west of North Ann Arbor Avenue. And the third item is C7158, the final plat of Deerbrook Station, Section 3, located south of Northwest 150th Street and east of North Rockwell Avenue. I'll take a motion. Well, let me ask first, I guess, is there anyone here who wishes to be heard on any of those items? If not, I'll take a motion. Motion to uh, approve. Uh, consent docket. Second. I have a motion and second to approve the consent docket. Call the roll, please. Powers? Yes. Coffee? Yes. Privet? Aye. Pinkle? Aye. Aye. Pennington? Aye. Cravens? Aye. LaForge? Yes. All approved. So uh, next on the agenda is our items requiring separate vote. Um, would you read those for us, please, Mr. Butler? Yes, item four is uh, PUD SP 1539. Uh, it's a specific plan pursuant to PUD 1539 located at 700 Southeast 89th Street. Who's gonna present this for us? JJ is gonna give us a summary. Yes, this is a specific plan, like Jeff said, for 1539. Uh, this is a location of the old Brookside Golf Course at 89th and Shields that was purchased by the Archdiocese of Oklahoma and rezoned back in August of 2014 for a campus for the Archdiocese. This represents the first of uh, the specific plan for that project. Staff reviewed it and found it consistent with the PUD 
the architect for the project, J.C. Witcher, is on the line if you have any questions for him. Commissioners, do we have any questions for the applicant? For uh, J.C. Witcher? If not, is there anyone else who wishes to be heard on this item? Uh, not, I'll take a motion. Okay, if no further discussion, I will move to approve PUD SP 1539A. Second. I have a motion and second to approve item number four. Call the roll, please. Howard. Yes. Coffee. Yes. Privet. Aye. Hinkle. Aye. Pye Smith. Aye. Pennington. Aye. Cravens. Aye. LaForge. Yes. All approved. Item number five is SPUD 1213, an application to rezone 1225 Northwest 33. This application is to permit a single family home and a new garage apartment in the back. Uh, staff recommended approval with two TEs uh, and the applicant agrees to both of those. Uh, the applicant is David Box. If you have any questions, he's on the line. Commissioners, I, I think this is a good use of this property. Um, I, I did send Mr. Box uh, a, an email this morning about a couple of minor points, but uh, overall I'm supportive of this application. Do we have any questions of the applicants? If, if not, is there anyone else who wishes to be heard on this item? Speaking, please. Who's speaking, please? It's Janice Powers. Janice Powers, thank you. If not, I'll take a motion. Madam Chair, seeing as how this is your ward, I'll make the motion to recommend approval to City Council for SPUD 1213, which is item number five on today's agenda. I second the motion. And subject to TEs? Yes. Yes, subject to the technical evaluations. I have a motion and a second. I'm sorry. Second the motion. I have a motion and a second to approve item number five. Call the roll, please. Powers. Yes. Coffee. Yes. Permit. Aye. Finkel. Aye. Aye. Smith. Aye. Pennington. Aye. Ravens. Aye. The Forge. Yes. Well approved. Item number six has been continued. Item seven is an application to rezone 15016 Gambles Trail Drive from PUD 1577 to SPUD. Okay, this application represents a spud for a dog daycare center at the uh, Quail North development. Uh, staff reviewed and recommended approval subject to two TEs, three TEs, excuse me. The applicant agrees with the first two and would like to amend TE3 uh, by establishing hours uh, of operation that the dogs will not be left outside any later than 9 p.m. And staff is okay with that amendment. David Box is the applicant and he's on the line. JJ, didn't I understand that that was... Uh the limitation on hours was subject to um, development in the area being residential? Yes, should, should the adjacent property be developed residential, then those hours would apply. No, thank you. Do we have any questions of the applicant? Uh, Madam Chair, I just note uh, this item being in Ward 8, I spoke to the applicant about this uh, today um, and understand the language around the proposed TE number three, which I don't have any disagreement with. Um, I did, uh, we did talk a little bit about 
the conditional use unit of outdoor displays and sales um, as it relates to some of the uses. We also talked about eliminating some of the uses. Um, you guys may not recall this. We've had a number of cases come through in this area recently. Just to refresh recollections of the commissioners, there was a um, Scooter's Coffee location and then an elementary school that came through on two different occasions. Um, in an effort to try to you know, combat and control some traffic development, even though it's unlikely, I asked the applicant to strike uh, the eating establishment use units, which creates a lot of coming and going traffic. Again, this is inside the development. It's not along the frontage. So I don't think it's highly likely to, you know, sort of become one of those uses, but it's just a protection because of the amount of traffic creation that's being generated here. Um, I'd be curious to know staff's take on the outdoor sales and storage. Um, and unless the applicant wants to reference any disagreement to the use units, I can specify those for the record. But as we discussed, um, those are my only questions at this point. Well, I do, David Box, 522 Colquitt Drive. I do have a question as it relates to the, the use units. My understanding was it was the um, drive-through use units that you were seeking to uh, eliminate. Is it all eating establishments that you're seeking to eliminate? So it would be 8300.36 okay. and 8300.35. Uh, Okay, so my client is on the line. Rebecca, are you okay with eliminating those two eating establishment use units? Yes, I'm okay with that. Okay. Um, JJ or someone from staff, could you comment on the conditional use for outdoor sales and display? Just concerns me a little bit because we do have retail sales and services general present here. I just, I just wanna make sure we're comfortable with the way that's articulated in the PUD. Yeah, I think that the applicant must have some kind of uh, idea for the use. We're limiting it at 20% of the prescribed parking area. I don't know what that would what that would be, what their intention is. David or Rebecca, one of you guys want to enlighten us on that? I'd like to strike that language unless it's absolutely necessary. And if it's necessary for your use, then I just want to attach it to the your intended use instead of this litany of potential uses. Sure, Rebecca. So do, is there any outside element of storage that you'll need for your operation? No. Okay. Uh, so what this language is, what we tried to do with this SPUD is carry over um, most of, if not all of the language that was you know, negotiated to some length in the PUD 1577. Um, so it's really just a carryover from that. So um, we can also strike that outdoor sales and display um, language as well. I'd like to do that as, as long as, it, I mean, if, if you want to tie it to the, to the intended use, I don't have a problem with that. I don't think Let's other commissioners would either, but. Let's just do that to be safe in case there's something unforeseen, but it'll, it would be required to be an accessory use to the doggy daycare use. And just to confirm, which use unit is, is doggy daycare? Is that animal uh, kennel and veterinary? 8300.10, yes. Got it. So how are we going to uh, do that? Those are the only Let's issues I have if there are other commissioners that have comments. <laughs> so I think the way we can do it is create a, a TE, uh, an additional TE to eliminate 8300.35, 8300.36, um, and then make 8300.54 an accessory to the 8300.10 use unit. Yeah, I'll Are just you... preserve in the record that we're going to amend the MDS, David. Uh, that's the way we've done it in the past. I don't think that's created any issues unless staff wants to do it differently, I, which I guess we can. But I'm indifferent, whatever staff wants. JJ, are you comfortable with that? Yeah, I'll that's just fine. make that clear when I make the motion. Okay. That's fine. It, other commissioners or people that want to be heard, Madam Chair? That's what I was just about to ask. Are you comfortable with the, the, with the elimination of the outdoor storage or the, the tying of it to the use unit that provides? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, is yeah. there anybody else present who wishes to be heard? If not, I'll take a motion. Okay. Uh, I'll also just point out before I make the motion, um, there was some discussion in the staff report about a landscape buffer to the south and the east. I talked to that with the applicant. 
the residential portion, there's some residential homes that are affiliated with the senior living center to the east. Um, and that is a, um, we measured it. It's over 400 feet from the back side of this property. So I didn't think adding anything there uh, to the east side was really necessary. It's also not something they own. There's a parcel to the east and it can be developed later. So it would really be kind of a moot point. So anyway, with that, uh, if there's no more discussion by the commissioners, um, I will make a motion to recommend approval to city council on SPUD 1211, um, subject to technical evaluations one and two, and adding uh, technical evaluation number three, which shall say, if the property immediately adjacent to the subject site is developed residentially, dogs will be required to be brought in by 9 p.m. Additionally, we want to modify the MDS to eliminate the use units 8300.36 and, and 8300.35. We also want to um, amend the language presented under the conditional use unit 8300.54 to specify that it must be accessory to the use of 8300.10. Okay. I have a motion, do I have a second? Second. A second. I have a motion and a second, call the roll please. Powers? Yes. Coffee? Yes. Rivet? Aye. Hinkle? Aye. Smith, Aye. Pennington? Aye. Cravens? Aye. LaForge? Yes. Rebecca, good luck with your project. Thank you. Okay, item eight is an application to rezone 16213 North Pennsylvania Avenue from PUD 923 and PUD 940 to SPUD 1212. This is an application for a multifamily project at 164th and Pennsylvania. Uh, staff has recommended approval with two TEs. TE1, the applicant would like to amend to provide 20% open space and agree to show the open space and type of amenities to provided prior to the application getting to council. And the applicant agrees with TE number two as it relates to Northwest 164th as they have no access to Pennsylvania. David Box is the applicant. Commissioners, do you have any question on this item? I'll, I'll jump into mine, get us moving here. Um, JJ, on the no access, that seems to make sense to me um, since they don't have access to Pennsylvania to not require the sidewalk. So are you guys right. in agreement with the uh, alteration of that TE? Yes. Okay. And he also indicated to me when we spoke about this item that they would provide pedestrian access back up to 164th. Are you comfortable that that's required by the language as presented? Yes. Okay. And then is staff comfortable with the amendment of 20 of the 25% open space requirement as outlined in the technical evaluation to 20%? Yes, with his agreement that it will be uh, the, the location and the type of amenities will be provided prior to council. I'd like to, we visited about that a little bit. Um, I asked him in our discussion about this item, if you know staff's primary concern, it was a little rhetorical, was just concerned that they would basically be providing this smattering of worthless open space instead of an actual open space amenity for the people at the complex, um, which you know, he said he agreed to. Do we need to memorialize this in um, the PUD in some way for the specific plan phase to be able to specifically review this open space requirement to make sure staff gets what they want there? Uh, David may have some language. Let's... The, the language... What's your what's your ask? We so on the open space, you yep. guys want to come back and tell us what you want to do with it. We need to be able to review and approve that if that's going to be the case. So we need to put in some language there for being able to review and approve the open space provided at specific plans for, uh, stage. Yeah, no, we're not agreeing to that. What we agreed to is that we'll on a master development plan map show the type. Uh, and location. That's what staff has asked us to do. 
Uh, it's a spud for a council. Right. There is no there is no specific plan for spuds. Oh, that's a good point. That's true. I'm sorry. So, JJ, are you comfortable with that? Is there another way we can do that for uh, the fact that it's an SPUD? What? No, we're, we're comfortable with that. We just want it. you know, it's kind of preliminary at this point. That gives them time to, to put some thought into it and provide us with the revised map showing the location. Okay. I'm almost certain they'll come back with some really effective open space. I'm sure That's David's true. in agreement with that. Yeah. He will. Uh, the only other thing that uh, he and I talked about on this application was the amendment to the architectural requirements, which we talked about, which was basically an agreement to uh, flip flop. So uh, amending the architectural requirement to be 60% brick veneer, rock or stone masonry, um, and then 40% uh, of other materials striking EFIS from that list, um, which they were in agreement with. Yes, Commissioner Craven's um, quest to rid our city of, of EFIS continues on uh, this week as well. And we're happy to accommodate his uh, deep-seated desire to eliminate EFIS. I'd like to point out to the public that EFIS is a building material that is commonly excluded from insurance policies that you're not aware of until hail like the ones that just ripped through Western Oklahoma, blow through the front of your EFIS, and then you find out you have to pay to replace it yourself. So we can remove EFIS. Excellent. That's all I have on my list. I'll turn it over to other commissioners or people who have signed up to be heard, Madam Chair. Do we have any other questions from the commission? If not, is there anyone else who wishes to be heard on this item? If not, I'll take a motion. Seeing no discussion by the commissioners, I'll make a uh, motion to recommend approval to city council on SPUD 1212. That is item number eight on today's agenda, subject to the technical evaluations, amending TE number one to require a 20% open space requirement and uh, amending TE number two to eliminate um, sidewalk requirement along North Pennsylvania Avenue, but maintaining the sidewalk requirement to Northwest 164th Street, including uh, pedestrian connectivity. Second. I have a motion and a second. Would you call the roll, please? No. Yes. Coffee? Yes. Privet? Aye. Hinkle? Aye. Ply Smith? Aye. Pennington? Aye. Ravens? Aye. LaForge? Yes. Thank you. Can we get the seconder to re identify themselves? I believe it was Commissioner uh, Privet, was it not? I think it was Hinkle. Ankle Thank you. Number nine is an application to rezone 12321 Southeast 119th Street from PUD 1664 to PUD 1762. This application is to rezone a 15 acre PUD that currently allows up to seven residential lots to uh, three five acre lots with shared access on 119th Street. Staff reviewed recommended approval. Uh, the applicant is Dwight Butler, who is on the line. Commissioners, do we have any questions of the applicant? If not, is there anyone else who wishes to be heard on this item? If not, I'll take a motion. No more discussion. I will move approval of PUD 1759. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve item number nine. Call the roll, please. Powers? Yes. Coffee? Yes. Rivet? Aye. Hinkle? Aye. Bye, Smith? Aye. Pennington? 
Aye. Travis? Aye. Ford? Yes. Then application to rezone 800 Riverport Drive from DTD2 downtown transitional general R1 single and I3 to PUD 1725. This application seeks to rezone 127 acres in the boathouse district to a PUD that will accommodate the entertainment and um, activity along the river. Uh, it was reviewed by the uh, Scenic River Design District on April 2nd, and they provided a recommend recommendation of approval of the PUD to the Planning Commission. Uh, Tim Johnson is on the line and is the app represents the applicant. Commissioners, do we have any questions of our applicant? Uh, this is no, this I'm is sorry, Commissioner Highsmith. Uh, I, I would like a, a rundown of the uh, um, purpose of the spud. I mean, I, I, you know, I talked with uh, I talked with Mark Zitzow at Johnson and Associates, and he gave a good uh, summary of why this this is before us. And I think it would be good just to verbalize that for um, not you know not just the commissioners but for the public in the meeting. At least that would be my opinion, that it would be helpful. Yeah, this is Tim Johnson. Um, and Mike Knopp is also uh, on the call. Uh, so the purpose of this, and we actually started it about a year ago, working with the staff to keep the Boathouse District from having to go before the Board of Adjustment every time there was an event or a change in signage uh, by the different uh, uh, event sponsors, uh, they set up booths, they set up signs and banners and flags, and all of which were not in compliance with the Scenic River Overlay. And so as we uh, began to review this with the staff and with the city attorney's office with regard to the fact that there were some restrictions on some of the condemned land uh, that had to be publicly used, and so we, that's what made the footprint of this PUD awkward uh, as you see it in your packet. Uh, so with that information, uh, it was difficult to produce a master plan that could be presented because of the public uh, use requirements. Uh, we didn't want the wrong impression to be given to those people who had uh, previously owned the land. And so we held back some information on that and have moved forward with the signage aspects. Uh, we worked very closely with the Scenic River Overlay uh, Design uh, District Committee uh, to ensure that we were matching um, the uh, requirements of the DTD with regard to building size, uh, make adjustments to buildings that were closer to the river versus over 100 feet away from the river. Uh, and then we've made agreements to come back with anything that's major with regard to the final signage. Uh, and those are defined and broken out in the document as, as you've read it. Uh, and so with that, they uh, agreed and approved uh, the document you have before you. And uh, uh, myself or Mike would be happy to answer any additional questions you might have. So just to, I, I guess to guess to recap that in like the simplest, dumbest way, would it, would it be fair to say that essentially this, um, because of the unique nature of the district and the fact that it is primarily um, uh, holding events and, it, um, you know, these are like public events, like uh, the, the boat races and whatnot, it, it, each of those events has to go through um, the signage review in some fashion. And so this essentially provides a, a blanket um, zoning ordinance for, for this overlay that allows for flexibility so that the citizens of Oklahoma City aren't paying 
for the city to go through the approval process every time we want to hold a new event? Would, th would that be, I don't even know if that was clearer, but is that kind of correct understanding to some degree? Yeah, that's partially correct. I think additionally the the district also required a minimum of two stories of which, as you know, the building heights down there are more than two stories, but the actual number of floors in the building on some of them are just one. And so there were those kinds of restrictions that we were bumping up against. And uh, I can let Mike address anything further on that. Uh, this is Mike Knopp here. Um, I, yeah, just to follow up with what Tim said, you know, we, as a, you know, trying to again, continue to make the Boathouse District a, a long-term sustainable asset for Oklahoma City. Obviously we wanna have these events. We were going to have had Olympic trials, but for COVID-19 and as well as an international event coming in August. And with those come a lot of signage requirements. And we certainly wanna promote the fact that we have these very, very high profile events, one of which was gonna be internationally televised. So we felt like it was it was important uh, to to take care of the you know we, we've been wanting to take care of this for some time. Also, we're trying to again make the district desirable for additional development to create some momentum, year-round momentum, and to draw people into the district. It's um, there's very little signage and there's a lot of confusion about how to actually get to the venue for those who've never been there, and so. Um, needing some additional signage is any major, you know, is, this has really become a, a destination for Oklahoma City and um, we have very little signage. So we want to um, to be able to address that. We're also um, bringing in, we hope, our first uh, outside development, which would be the Barquet Dog Park. And um, and certainly they're going to, for them to, to follow through in their, their plan, they're gonna expect to be able to have um, better signage that directs people into the districts. Um, well, one further question then that I, the, um, I think your comments raised for me is, uh, is, this, is this PUD, um, the land that is included, the lots that are included ownership wise, is how much of this, if any, is, is purely private development that the city is uh, rezoning on their behalf? Or, or am I hearing this wrong? None of the property is uh, privately held. It's all in the uh, the lease of the uh, Boathouse Foundation, and it's all owned by the city. Okay, that, that's kind of what I thought, but I wanted to make sure. All right. Commissioners, anyone else have questions or comments? I have a couple of questions. Uh, this is Commissioner Cravens. Um, just a, a couple of little questions, Tim, and then uh, maybe staff. As I look at this, there's a couple of things. Um, one thing that just stood out to me on the uses prohibited, gasoline sales small is listed, but gasoline sales large is not. I thought that was weird. I didn't know if that was an oversight or intentional or what. And the other thing, the real question I have is there's a couple places in the application that talk about the review uh, in your MDS. So for example, under signage regulations, it says uh, the final locations and design shall be reviewed and approved by the Riverfront Design Committee. A little further down under 9.10.2, it says an undetermined number of freestanding signs less than 15 feet in height shall be permitted and reviewed by an administrative approval process by the City of Oklahoma City Urban Design Staff. Are these typical forms of review for things like this? Um, and if if not, what is the reason for for um, putting those items in the PUD? I don't necessarily have an issue with either one of them. I'm just curious about why, really. So, to the I think the simple answer is, is as I mentioned earlier, is the the there are two major signs that are proposed and those are held out and described differently. And those are the ones that would come back to the uh, Scenic River Overlay for their review. Uh, all the rest of the signs would be uh, submitted to staff for their review and approval. And that's how it is today. Uh, the question with uh, regard to um, 
uh, the uh, gasoline sales large. It's not per permitted in the current DTD now. That's why we didn't exclude it. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. That DTD2 thing is a little confusing. So I, I figured there was something there I was missing. I just didn't know that's what it was. Thanks for clarifying that. JJ or, or Jeff Butler, can one of you guys mind weighing in on these staff level or committee level reviews of signage and approval? Yeah, that's, uh, the, the staff level uh, approvals are, are pretty typical. Uh, we try and set a threshold for the urban zone districts, that is, uh, for things that are minor. Uh, there are uh, staff approvals just to minimize the the amount of time and expense that it takes uh, for developers uh, and you know that this threshold was chosen for this uh, particular uh, and, and for this particular case and the, and the, the committee felt like it was appropriate uh, in the opinion um, but that's it's pretty standard for us to do we do a lot of administrative approvals okay okay um, well I appreciate it uh, obviously this is you know, something that we all want to see succeed. And Mike, like a lot of people, small businesses and others that have been affected by this, I'm sure sorry uh, about the level of impact that, you know, uh, River Sports area has seen as a result of COVID-19. I know that must be very disappointing to you and I'm sorry to hear all that. I appreciate that. We're, uh, <laughs> we got a plan to get started again when it's the right time, but um, we're hoping people are ready to get outside, so. <laughs> Well, I will be, um, and, and I appreciate what you do, and, and um, I wish you well. Thank you. Commissioners, are there any additional questions for the applicants? If not, is there anyone else who wishes to be heard on this item? If not, I'll take a motion. This is Commissioner Pennington. Um, I'm excited about uh, being able to go back outside whenever it's appropriate, whenever uh, COVID-19 is over with and excited about the work that you all are doing. So I want to echo uh, Commissioner Craven's comments about that. Um, and with that, I move approval of item 10. I'll second that motion. I have a motion and a second to approve item number 10. Do you call the roll, please? Power. Yes. Coffee. Yes. Privet. Aye. Pinkle. Aye. Highsmith. Aye. Pennington. Aye. Cravens. Aye. LaForge. Yes. Item 11 is an application to rezone 326 Northwest 62nd Street from R1 to I2 Moderate Industrial. JJ has a summary. Okay, this is a straight zoning application from R1 to I2. Staff's review, uh, we found that there are still a couple of homes existing on 62nd Street and the surrounding zoning is still R1. There's a significant amount of R1 around. So we recommended uh, an amendment to I-1, which would keep everything indoors. Um, the applicant, I believe, has indicated that they prefer to keep the I-2 just for the marketability purposes of the, uh, of the property. Uh, the applicant is Roger Jones, and he should be on the line. Mr. Jones, are you with us? Mr. Jones. Um, I think Mr. Jones is on the line. I think he's trying to figure out how to unmute his, his uh, microphone. Or six. Mr. Jones, if you'd hit star six, if you, you're calling in. This, this is Mark Nash, Roger Jones, his business partner. Um, Roger is on a, is, is on a headset on his PC. Roger, in the upper right-hand corner where your name is, you should see uh, with your mouse pointed there, you should see a mute, unmute button. Click on it. And also hold the space bar, that works too.
Well, I can speak for him <laughs> if you would allow me to. <laughs> Well, I, I guess the question is more whether he would allow you to. Um, this is Janice Powers. I am the commissioner for Ward 2. Um, I was wondering whether you had had any contact at all with the Association of Property Owners there in, in the area um, that is between Broadway Extension and the railroad north of the highway and south of 63rd Street. The, the last time we, we received any communication from that association was back in 2008. Um, and what was really interesting about it was they originally were calling themselves, I think, the Bellevue Neighborhood Association. And then they went into discussions about becoming the Robinson Hill uh, Association, but they chose Neighborhood Association, even though on their letterhead they say a redevelopment business district um, in that entire eight roughly 84 acres you're talking about commissioner powers um, there are only there are only two or three houses one of them is abandoned and falling down if it hadn't already been torn down one of them is being used for storage and then the one right actually right across the street kind of catty cornered from our property uh, is the only occupied um, house at this time and, and Ted has actually been watching over this property for us since we purchased it back in um, the early 2000s. Well you're right there there is nothing about this area that would suggest that it is going to be residentially developed and I, I don't think that was ever the intention of the of the association. Uh, neighborhood association may have just been an easy uh, way to describe the organization, but did you participate in that process at the time that they were doing the plan for the area and so on? Um, I did not. And if, if, if Roger has figured out how to unmute his microphone, <laughs> he might be able to answer if he attended any of those meetings. Um, you know, I, I do know that, that when we discussed what would be more appropriate I1 or I2 on this, we looked at the zoning map and did some calculations. And out of that roughly 84 acres, 40% um, of the property in there is already zoned I2. Um, and there's only 6% that's zoned I1. Um, you know, and yeah, the, that particular, the, our particular, uh, plot there that that we own those those lots is surrounded still by what is r1 um, which is all wooded um, i've actually got some aerial photos if i could share my screen if you want to go that deep um, well, we can show you what it looked yes ma'am if if you want to and, and uh if other commissioners would like to see that that would be fine i i'm fairly familiar with this area and it is true that a lot of the zoning up there is industrial this area is clearly something you know an area that's in transition it's been a pretty slow transition uh, just like it has been for the area north of 63rd street but uh, you know at, at the time of the adoption of plan okc when this area was identified as a transportation um, node if you will or a transportation oriented uh, overlay uh, i think uh, layer, I guess is what they call it. Um, I think that the the thought was that the future of this area would be something other than the hard industrial that seems to be, um, you know, mixed in <laughs> with the residential uses throughout those uh, 84, or it, if that's what you said, acres. Um, I, I myself, I'll just tell you straight up, cannot support a straight I-2 zoning on this property. Even I, straight I-1 would be hard for me. I would really like to see this property developed through a PUD uh, or SPUD. And I, I know that that is difficult to do if your um, purpose in rezoning it is purely uh, you know, speculative or for investment purposes. I mean, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But um, I, I would have a hard time supporting that here. I, I believe that that uh, 
if you, if you wanted to continue this item and let us get with you to work through some issues, um, Roger would like to use this, this particular piece of land to build um, offices for his construction company and a cabinet shop. Um, the whole reason why I2 seemed to fit because of the surrounding I2 was if he ever got a, a job, he does um, home construction and home remodels, but if he ever got a, uh, a big job and needed to, to be assembling pieces of, of cabinets before they were moved on site, um, I too would allow him to work out in the parking lot or the yard, if you will, um, as opposed to I-1. But uh, I mean, we, we could do I-1 or we could continue it and, and work through some issues. I mean, I know you had some other issues. Um, we've already dealt with uh, the dry creek bread issue that's running through the western part of that. Back when we came to the city in 2008, there's a 42 inch culvert running through there now to redirect that that creek bed if you would be willing to continue this item two and weeks and then on the street you also talked about the street issue and when we purchased the property believe it or not the street the street actually ran all the way down to our first lot and it has eroded away when when the, when erosion completely cut the street off we put an 18 inch tin horn and, and put crack, crushed gravel over it. And when the city came back, they laid down some, some overlay down to the end of, of Ted Drake's property, but stopped short about, a, about 100 to 120 feet short of where the road was originally. If you would be willing to continue this item for two weeks until our May 14th meeting, I would very much appreciate the opportunity for us to discuss and work through some of these issues. I, I think I'd like be, to be able to support your application. Yeah, I, I think that's more than more than appropriate. We we can do that. Thank you very much. Commissioners, I'll take a motion. Um, Madam Chair, being this is your ward, I'll make your motion. I'll make a motion to uh, continue PC 10655. And I believe it is May the 14th. Yes. Second. I have a motion and a second to continue item number 11 until May the 14th. Would you cast your vote? Oh, I'm sorry. Would you call the roll, please? Powers? Yes. Coffee? Yes. Rivet? Aye. Tinkle? Aye. Weissman? Aye. Kennington? Aye. Craven. Aye. LaForge. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Item 12 is an application to rezone 1316 Northwest 15th Street from R3. JJ, do you want to give us a summary? Sorry, I was muted. I was halfway through my summary. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is for an infill residential lot that proposes two uh, up to single family through four family. Uh, staff had one technical evaluation in an attempt to retain existing row of trees along the west side. The applicant is unsure, as staff is, as the uh, health and viability of those trees. So they proposed uh, to provide for two trees uh, in the front setback, and we're fine with that. Ryan Kyle is the applicant and should be on the line. Commissioners, yep, do we, I'm sorry, commissioners, do we have any comments or questions for our applicants? Is there anyone else who wishes to be heard on this item? If not, I'll take a motion. Well, this one's a, a pretty easy one for me. Uh, it's in my ward. You guys know the things that I hold important. And I think this uh, 
this checks a lot of those boxes. So I'm going to make a recommendation uh, for approval. Second. I have a motion and second to approve item number 12. Would you call the roll, please? Powers. Yes. Coffee. Yes. Privet. Aye. Hinkle. Aye. Aye, Smith. Aye. Pennington. Aye. Cravens. Aye. LaForge. Yes. Approved. Item 14 is an application to rezone 2112 Northwest 20th Street from R1 to SPUD 1210. It's another application for infill residential. It seeks to direct two single family homes on uh, an 80 foot wide lot. Staff reviewed and recommended approval. Uh, David Box is the applicant but I understand there are protesters signed up to speak. Uh, before I call on them, commissioners, do we have any questions of the applicant? This is Commissioner Pennington. Could we just, just so that I can clarify in the most simple language, are we really just arguing over, are we really just arguing over 10 feet in the minimum lot width? Is that the issue? Yes, sir. Um, this is David Box. Yes, that's correct. We meet the minimum square footage for an R1 single family lot. Each lot will be 6,000 square feet. And so it is uh, a 10 foot of, of frontage. And, and so that's why we're here through this application. Um, what staff has noted in the staff report is one way that we're able to um, remedy any problem is we're going to have one shared drive. So we're not going to have what could otherwise be two curb cuts. There'll be one curb cut with a shared drive each home will have their own um, garage. Uh, but yeah, so we meet all of the regs for R1, but for that that uh, 10 feet, but we meet the size requirements for two separate single family lots. And you still meet all the, you'll meet the setback requirements, I'm assuming, and all of that. So as far as... Yeah, we'll have a front yard 25 foot, side yard five, uh, rear yard 10 foot. Are the so setback. literally the only visual difference is 10 feet separation. Yes, except there'll only be one curb cut rather than two, which I, I think cuts towards it being better than two traditional single family lots. Gotcha, thank you. Commissioners, anyone else? I do have, um, folks who are signed up to speak. And I'm sorry, I don't have that name right in front of me. Is it, is it uh, Mr. Muncy? Yes. Yes, it's Mr. Muncy. Would you give us our, your views on this item, please? Uh, yes, I, um, I don't think the two houses in that neighborhood, since I've lived there for 50 plus years, will uh, help our value of our homes. I think it'll bring our home value down. Plus parking on the street is hard enough. Um, my job, I have a trailer I have to bring home every once in a while, 20 foot. I can't hardly get in my driveway when everybody's parked on the street. I have to ask people to move. Um, I don't think it's good for um, emergency vehicles to come down the street with this one driveway and it cuts into everybody space there and plus I don't think the properties are um, measured up right because I've got 70 feet where everybody else has 75 and of course they have 80 next door but they're saying five feet added I'm not sure about that I don't know I'm not quite on clear on all that issue right there but those are my concerns that I think the, pro the property is worth more than what a two houses can bring to the neighborhood. And I think it's going to be, and they don't fit the neighborhood as houses that are there. I think it's going to hurt us property wise, value wise. Uh, I'm redoing my house and I know some of the other people are redoing their houses too in the neighborhood. That's my, uh, my views on it. And I really don't think that it's uh, good for the neighborhood. 
to help our property value. David, what size houses are these going to be? Uh, let me pull up the plans. Uh, my belief is I've got them right here. Oh, around two, these will be two story homes, um, 2,000 or so square feet, give or take. Um, like I said, each of them will have a uh, detached garage and back. Um, presumably that will go to help the, the, the street parking issue. I did have the opportunity to speak to Mr. Muncie and, and you know, um, it, it is a public street. Northwest 20th Street is a public street. Uh, parking happens along public streets. It happens, uh, my guess would be in, in all of our neighborhoods. Um, uh, so th there's really nothing we could do there other than the fact that we're gonna have garages, I think will, will help that in terms of the large trailer that he has, um, two single family homes next to his home. I don't, I'm not sure how that could go um, against his desire to drive his, his trailer down the street, given that we're gonna meet all the appropriate setbacks. And again, we'll have garages uh, to help uh, accommodate those. What about noise noise ordinance? I mean, what what about all the noise that a two story house will bring in? I'll be stuck between two two, two story houses. What about the noise ordinance? I mean, I, I I don't want to hear somebody next door to me in their house talking or doing whatever. So the city has noise noise ordinances. Um, I, I've never heard of complaints um, of a violation of the noise ordinance of just a typical single family resident in their home uh, next to another single family resident. You know, certainly when you're uh, outside, if my neighbors are outside, I can hear them. Uh, my guess is all of you are, are the same way. Um, so the city does have noise ordinances. And if, if there was something that was being done that was not proper at these single family homes that was creating a noise issue, you could call the action center. They could come out and read the decibel level and, and see if they were violating the decibel level for single family development. Um, I'm not sure what else to say other than Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is, do I have someone else signed up to speak on this item? I was. Okay, will you give us your name and address, please? My name is Dorothy Weaver, 2100 Northwest 20th Street. And they, um, they dropped off copies of the plans and I don't see that garage is on it. I see a driveway that is too narrow that doesn't go all the way back. Mr. Box? Um, yeah, I'm pulling up the site plan. Uh, if, you, if you look at the, the site plan, you'll see um, the site plans included within the SPUD clearly show um, garages behind it. Um, I'm not sure what, I'm not sure what she is referring to and who dropped it off. I know that at one point there was quite a bit of misinformation being disseminated, uh, not from us, but from other neighbors, uh, which is what generated a lot of the protest. Uh, it was uh, stated that it was going to be um, rentals. These won't, these will be marketed for sale, uh, but they, they will each have a um, garage structure. David, my site plan is pretty limited. I mean, it, it's got yeah, so is mine. huge structures and a, you know, a boundary and that's about it. Yep, same David. You might have sent us all the wrong uh, site plan. No, I mean, what I have in my SPUD received by Development Services March 4th has a significant list, including uh, all of the renderings. Um, I didn't so get those. It was filed with the document. so I, I don't, don't have any of that stuff. Yeah. Well, I've that's got one. beside the point, though, right? I mean, that's beside the point, the final design of this. What's at issue here is the use. A single family home on 6,000 square feet. Not the final design of this. We meet all the setbacks, we meet density. That is what is at issue. Well, to be We've fair, got Mr. Bob, in the neighborhood a lot of new houses. I'm sorry. It, let, it, in the I neighborhood, there have been a. Okay. But to be fair, Mr. Box, I think you know the issue of, of parking has been raised, and you have countered that by explaining that there will be garages and so forth. So. It's, it's not completely unreasonable that people would want to see where that is. I agree that the site, any site plan that's being provided to us at the moment is not you know, set in stone in any event. If, if the um, assurance is, and if it's documented that, that there will be 
uh, garages and so on, then I think that's probably the best we can do on that. Am and I we, wrong about that, uh, staff? We can do that in the SPUD. We can commit that each structure will have a garage. With a and then there would be a shared drive between the two. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Ms. Weaver. Ms. Weaver, you were still speaking. You had something else to say? Might have lost her. Seth, is there anything we can do to help her find her way back to us? She is on the line and I have unmuted her. Ms. Weaver, did you have additional thoughts you wanted to share with us? I'm sorry, my connectivity isn't holding. I understand. Mine's a little bouncy too. Um, I just wanted to say that we've... We've got... A number of vacant lots have gotten very nice houses over the last few years, and these two tiny houses crammed onto this lot seems like a step back for the neighborhood. That was it. What are typical sizes of uh, houses in this neighborhood? Oh, uh, usually single story, 20, uh, 2000 ish square feet. It's an old neighborhood. Most Isn't of the houses were built in the 20s. D David, it's you... not a nice, nice neighborhood, but it's a nice old neighborhood. D David, didn't you say 2,000 square feet on the home size? Yeah, that, and perhaps even more because they're going to be two story. Um, but I mean, that, that's a good kind of what we believe they're going to be. Um, but with the fact that they're two story, we may be, you know, higher than that on, on some of them. So, M Mrs. Weaver, it sounds like they're meeting um, the median home size according to uh, what you've reported. I mean, does that satisfy your concern in that regard? As Ms. Weaver is considering her response to that question, I might I might say this, um, not to try to really make you feel okay about this, uh, because that's uh, not really um, the goal here. But I, I would just, by way of explanation, let you know that Plan OKC um, uh, encourages a mix of housing types uh, and sizes and price points. Um, and especially with respect to infill development, in these older core neighborhoods. Uh, we are encouraging this kind of density. I personally am in favor or do favor um, these multiple single family dwellings over duplexes and fourplexes. It's just a personal preference um, in these older neighborhoods, but you tend to find both even in the, um, in the existing housing stock. Uh, I think it, the idea of this kind of infill can be a little bit scary, but I would just share with you for what it's worth that in those places where it has been realized, and I have a number of them in my ward, uh, they've really worked out pretty well. If they were proposing four houses on these two um, on this lot, or um, you know six dwelling units, or even three, frankly, I think that would be too much for me. But these two single family dwellings, I tend to believe are a nice fit. They really don't create a lot of problems with respect to parking or noise or, you know, any of those things. I would, um, I'd add to that, that obviously we hear the concerns about property values quite a bit whenever a new product's coming into a neighborhood. I'm not sure that this is necessarily a new product. But we hear those concerns a lot, and in that regard, I've tracked down as best as I can um, the opinions of many of 
the uh, board of appraisers for Oklahoma. And it was my understanding in having those conversations that it is common practice um, when appraising values within a neighborhood to to differentiate, to say these houses are different than those houses, and so they aren't good comps. Um, I find it, you know, makes sense to me that you would not, um, you know, uh, comp a, 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 you know, quote unquote tiny home to a to a normal sized home, especially when the lot size is different. And I come and I came to find out through those conversations that that is true, that they do not do that. Um, they seem to be, you know, universally in uh, in agreement that that is not a common practice. And if anyone was doing it uh, as an appraiser within Oklahoma, that they would be going contrary to, uh, you know, the, the general approach on assessing home values. So, you know, i.e. short story is, again, my understanding from the people that actually appraise home values is that there is a general misunderstanding in the public how these types of infill developments might affect their home value. Um, so I, I do think it's a, it's a larger uh, kind of discussion that needs to be had with uh, the, the different neighborhood associations um, to understand uh, maybe the, you know, maybe the concerns mm -hmm. over these are a little bit overblown, but anyway, I, I wanted to throw that in, uh, you know, just a little bit of added color. Are these houses for sale or for rent? They'll be marketed for sale. Uh, we believe the price to be somewhere between three and three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. What they'll be marketed for? Do I have anyone else who is signed up to speak? Yes, uh, Bill Freeman, twenty-one fifteen Northwest Nineteenth. Give us your thoughts, Mr. Freeman. Well, I, th I think some of this, there seems to be, uh, I think much like the commissioners, the materials that we received in the neighborhood seem to be missing some elements. So we're all not working off the same page, literally. And that would certainly be helpful uh, to those in the neighborhood to know the more, uh, more detailed views on the proposed development because all, all that is available through the public website is the, the most cursory of schematic. It's really hard to tell what is being proposed. My position mainly comes from the fact of that this is, this is uh, discontinuous with their surrounding neighborhood. In my written materials, it shows, you know, this is a pretty contiguous area of, you know, 75 foot lots. And then you go on the east side of uh, Penn and you get into the 50 and 55 foot lots that were set up in the 20s. Um, so this is really out of character with the neighborhood. And there is a lot of, and I believe even the owner is on the line here, uh, of a property four doors down that was successful infill development without changing lot sizes, which is one of the goals of the plan OKC medium development uh, intensity areas is to maintain those system of lot sizes. This is not against development in any way, shape or form. This is more to continue the very successful development that's been in the neighborhood for the last six years that I've been here uh, and, and going down this route to a high density uh, or much higher density just tracks from the neighborhood in the sense of uh, it, it isn't following the characteristics of the neighborhood. I understand, you know, I understand the, the realities of changing the, the street frontage width and the lot size, but there's lots of good examples of how to continue the laudable goals of infill development without having to slice and dice into these, these bare minimum lots. Um, Mr. Freeman, that's a, that's a uh, great point. Well taken. Um, I would say, you know, one of the struggles that we have in ward six is that, you know, we're the, we're the ward closest to downtown and when cities, uh, develop density, they develop it from the center out typically. And of course, we're in the oldest neighborhoods in the city. And the more that we push density outside of Ward 6, uh, the less, um, you know, the more really like inequality that we as a planning commission kind of force on the city. This is, this is what I struggle with. You know, I'm telling you just like, 
the issues that we have to consider and think through. And, um, at, you know, another one of the big goals of that plan OKC document is to, is to provide a variety of options for any citizen in Oklahoma City to potentially be able to live in any neighborhood. And while I'm, I totally understand homes are very large investment. Um, it's, it's, you know, critical investment for everyone. Uh, it, it's still, you know, every, every lot purchase is, is still a risk and we can't necessarily be here just for the property owners as a, as a protection against that investment. We have to also consider all of the other citizens that might have, um, you know, reason, good reason and necessity to live closer to downtown, to be closer to core services. It, it's good for a variety of reasons. I would love at some point, um, I'm not sure if uh, this area has a neighborhood association. I, I don't think I've been um, invited to a meeting just yet, but I'd love to come and talk um, about these same issues and hopefully uh, kind of help reach a better understanding of, of, I think a lot of the goals that the commission uh, you know, looks to implement and, and, you know, the, I guess, talk about the other side of the coin that we see a lot that I don't think gets uh, presented very much in these meetings because it's very rare to get renters to a, uh, obviously these are for sale units, so I don't want to go off track here, but, um, uh, you know, to get the people that, that, that are looking for this density in the conversation as well. Um, all that said, you know, I, I just hope that you understand kind of the, you know, the opposite side of the coin and the and the pressures for development and for density close to downtown. We don't typically, I, I think a lot of times we lose, we lose sight of the fact of how close these neighborhoods are, you know, to, to really be downtown. It's, it's practically, walk, you know, walkable and bikeable. I, I live very near here and I, I walk. So, um, you know, I, I I feel like I'm going on long here, so I'm going to stop, but I, I, I hope you, hopefully you get the point of, of what I'm making. Mr. Freeman, this is um, uh, Commissioner Powers. Uh, I'm looking at um, uh, materials that I think you submitted to us uh, with your uh, protest letter. And uh, the, this particular, I'm not quite sure what it is I'm looking at. It's certainly not a, it's neither an aerial nor a, um, plat, but it, it's titled proposed lot subdivision is out of character of the neighborhood. Lot is a, is within a large contiguous area of R1 single family homes without existing SPGs. And as I'm looking at it, there seem to me to be a handful at least of sort of clusters of homes. And I, I'm not quite sure, um, you know, what they represent along um, on the north side 20th, just across the street from the indication of this site, there, there's this sort of little triangle of three homes, uh, 2119, 2119, sort of front and back and next door to 2113. Now, maybe it's just the two there that I should be looking at. On 19th Street, uh, which would be west, I guess, of Barnes, there's like 2209, 2207, which show on this drawing, this depiction or whatever it is exactly, you know, all, virtually on top of each other. There's another one on um, 21st Street, just uh, east of Flynn, and another one south of 19th, just east of Flynn, where there it shows like two homes that are virtually on top of each other. There are others along 21st Street, east of Barnes. So uh, uh, it seems to me that there must be, if, if I understand what I'm looking at here, perhaps you can tell me what it is if I'm not looking at it correctly, but it, it looks to me like there are some uh, places within the very nearby, within the neighborhood, where there are sort of multiple units. Uh, well, this I just pulled this from the tax assessor. I'm I'm no, I'm, I'm not a real estate attorney. So, I things like the 2207 and 2209 19th Street. That is a single dwelling. Um, 
a single building. So I, I think rather the next slide that actually has the, the, the actual lots as pulled from uh, also the city website gives a better, a better view on the actual lots in the neighborhood and their respective widths. And this was just what I pulled from the tax assessor's website. I, I, I don't know. Okay. Understand. I won't hold you responsible for <laughs> it. <laughs> and I wasn't related to that, Freeman, so um, I really won't it, take responsibility. <laughs> Is there anyone else signed up to speak on this item? Yes, I am. Hello? Give us your name and address uh, for the record, Dean, please. Um, Dean Richards, 2107. Northwest 20th Street. I reside right across the street from this property. Uh, I was dropped off the plans by the lady who sold the property to this development company. So that's the only information that we have was distributed to the neighborhood. My biggest concern is I love to see my house was a single family. My house was a duplex before I bought it, it was gutted and redone. It's a single family pre uh, property now. Um, I've lived here two years. Uh, with the intent that that property crossed, that vacant lot was a single family residence. My biggest concern is on what I have is on the site that I have, although I got two drawings of what should be houses, there's a future permit that states it's a community recreation property. That's my biggest concern. It says- uh, Mr. Mr. Richards, that is very typical language. Um, uh, formation of a homeowners association or property owners association that is uh, formed for the for the maintenance of whatever shared or common area there is. Okay, so that that's not a. Why does it say future? Permit? Because it just says future permit on the plans. Like I said, I think um, as um, Bill had said before, we don't have the correct information, so we can't even understand what's going on. So it's pretty scary when you have something, you think there's a duplex. The last thing we need is duplexes in this neighborhood. We finally have getting rid of the crack houses that they're redoing and rebuilding and bringing this neighborhood back to life. Um, unfortunately, parking is a huge issue because our sidewalks are in disarray. And the only way that we can ride our bikes or our grandchildren or our kids can ride our bikes is on the street. And they're in and behind cars coming out all the time. It's, it's not safe. Uh, so parking is a huge, issue for all of us that live in this neighborhood. Um, but my biggest concern is, why, does it say is why it says future permit on this. Says Instead, just, I'm, I'm fine with a single family residence. It's, it's just it, as a, I, I don't know anything about the law or the city stuff. So it's all worded so that an average person can't understand what's going on. So one says residential and one says future permit. Because on what I have, um, one Mr. residence, one has future president, future res permit, future permit. I don't, I don't see that on my documentation. Mr. Box, I guess you can figure out where this is going. I gather you have not had the opportunity to meet with the neighbors, to have a neighborhood meeting, show them your plans and get their comments, questions, and see if you can answer or assuage their concerns. I, I talked to a few, I, I several people refused to, to talk to me. We sent an olive branch through the, the realtor that we bought it from. Um, we, we can give them any information. I don't know why we couldn't do that between now and city council, given that this is, in my opinion, very uh, standard single family. There are no technical evaluations. We meet lot sizes. Um, I'm not sure what they're referring to on future permits, other than maybe the, the design plan say future permits, because we haven't submitted them yet. Um, but th this is just single family residential. They're, it is what it is. We can certainly give them the um, build plans that we've got, show them exactly what it'll look like. Uh, my client, Jack and Nash, uh, I know Nash is on the line, asked multiple times to reach out uh, and, and were denied the opportunity uh, that we then sent the realtor to avoid this very scenario uh, to distribute some information. Uh, but I'm happy to have a, a, a meeting at any time between now and city council where we can, we can do Zoom. I can share the documents through my screen, show them exactly what will be built. Uh, David, and this is Commissioner Cravens, I, I wouldn't be in favor of continuing the item anyway. It doesn't matter what it looks like. That's not what we're here to talk about. 
Um, and that's not even us for to, to decide. That's there are ordinances and building codes and all kinds of things that are going to dictate what happens. Frankly, whatever you show us here is nothing more than a picture. It could wind up being something totally different. And that's why we don't get into these sorts of conversations at any great length, at least by and large. Um, there's no reason to continue the item because I agree that this is very straightforward. Um, it may not be something that the neighbors necessarily are excited about. This is probably the 30th infill development project we've seen like this um, in and around these surrounding neighborhoods. This is going to continue. There's been a policy to support it. I haven't seen anything different about this application that would change that policy for me. I, I'm ready to, to, to vote on this um, unless there's another commissioner that wants to be heard about it. This Commissioner Pennington, I, I, I want to just say quickly, I completely agree. We're talking about adding two $300,000 houses as opposed to one in a beautiful neighborhood that can accommodate it. And we're arguing about 10 feet of space. I mean, 100% important thing. I just want to make sure, you want to sell them for $200,000? First of all, excuse me. Um, first of all, I have not determined whether or not there are other persons who are signed up to speak. If there are, we certainly will hear from them. Um, I, I would like, just because it's my word to throw in my two cents on the current conversation. Um, I, I mean, candidly, I, I have to agree again with, with Cravens and uh, Kamal on I current, currently I support this. This is, this is very... I'm, I'm hearing somebody. <laughs> this is a very typical approach. Uh, we see this a lot. I, you know, because it's in my ward and I, um, I want to be sensitive to the uh, opinions of, of the people that live within the ward. I, you know, I'd, I'd love to have uh, David be able to meet with the, the concerned citizens absolutely between now and city council. Um, I was shared, uh, you know, of course, by, by David. David shared the emails with uh, some of the local neighbors that refused to talk to him. I do think uh, there, there oftentimes it becomes a very adversarial relationship, which goes um, honestly like hurts the neighbors and having their voices heard. Um, so I, I don't recommend that approach to anybody. Have the conversations. This is your time to be able to negotiate. Um, uh, and so, you know, just because of, of that and, uh, and, and this being a very typical type of redevelopment, I also support having a vote on this today, um, but I, again, I'm sensitive to uh, the, the neighbors in this area, and I would like that meeting to still occur between now and city council as, a, as a, the representation states. A absolutely, I, I, will, uh, I will reach out uh, tomorrow. Um, my client just texted me. He'd love to meet too. Um, to, I, I'm, I've got a few email addresses. I know I've got a few phone numbers, so I commit that starting tomorrow we'll, we'll call and get as many contact information, uh, as much contact information for people as we can and uh, work to get a meeting as soon as possible. So, David, uh, for the benefit of the people that are on the call that may be listening in by phone and not able, will you provide your email address a couple of times so people have sure. a means to contact you so that you can send this information directly to anybody who wants to see it? Yeah, I can do that. So my email address is D as in David, M as in Michael, B O X at W, B as in boy, F as in Frank, B as in boy, L A W dot com. So I'll say it one more time. It's D M B O X at W B F B L A W dot com. A chairperson Thanks, powers. This is uh, Zagnash Public Information. We have one person that has their hand raised to speak. Pat Jones, uh, you are yeah. now un unmuted. Mr. Jones or Ms. Jones, I shouldn't uh, assume. Mr. Jones, if that's who I'm hearing, I cannot understand you. Will you come closer to your device or? I, I can't hear anything. Thank you. 
Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Okay, I think that Mr. Jones has been muted again. Uh, there is another resident, uh, Madeline Benham. Zach, are you able to help Mr. Jones to see if he can uh, more effectively communicate with us? Yes, I'm, I'm working on that. Thank you. And uh, we do have others signed up to speak. That was a question. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, Hi. Madeline Benham. This you is Madeline Benham. Ms. Benham? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I, I just wrote my, uh, my letter yesterday, so you have not probably had a, an opportunity to look at it. And uh, I'd like to address a couple of excuse things. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Could you give us your uh, name and address for the record, please? Yes, Madeline Benham, B-E-N-H-A-M. 2112 Northwest 19th. Thank you. I have lived in the neighborhood for 27 years. And that gives you a certain view of, of uh, the development and changes in the neighborhood that might not be available to someone who has not been here for quite as long. One of the things that I've seen is I saw the era of great poverty I was here during the era of the crack houses. That's over. And there is great prosperity in our neighborhood. And this prosperity has been accompanied by infill that has taken place without splitting lots. It has not been necessary to split lots in order to improve the infill, density, or prosperity of our neighborhood. Now, the reason this is of concern, this issue of splitting the lot, is because the parking problem is more of an issue than you would think. I was so delighted about the changes that happened in Gatewood, I really would have been very surprised to hear that I would ever be speaking up against such a proposal. But I am. I am opposed to this proposal because of the terrible things that have happened to Gatewood. The parking there is such an issue, you cannot, you literally, some nights, cannot get through on 17th, 18th, 19th, and of course not on 16th. You simply can't get through. People are parked on both sides of the street. These streets were built in the 1920s. They're not wide streets. And I know that sounds like a minor issue, but it really isn't. I was standing in my front, year a few, my front yard a few years ago when I saw a child knock from his bicycle because he had to go into the other lane, the incorrect lane, in order to get around a parked car. And the person who hit him, the motorist who hit him, was turning on to Northwest 19th from 10. That motorist could not possibly have seen that child. It was not his fault. It was also not the fault of the child. It was the fault of the parked cars on the street. That is not a minor issue. It is an issue of life and death. People get hurt. People get hurt when you put in place conditions that result in over-parking. And you may say to me, well, we're providing some parking. We're going to put garages back there. Each of those houses will have two or more adults living in them in all likelihood. Every one of those adults will own an automobile. And I know we would all love it. We would all love it if people would just ride the bus. But we do not currently have a mass transit system that makes that possible. I want us to be realistic about the way people get to work and get around in this city. Right now, we do that in our automobiles. Wish it weren't so, but it is so. And finally, I'd like to address one more issue. Uh, the commissioner, commissioner who spoke about the, uh, the desire to increase density in order to afford more equality to everyone, including renters. I think it's very disingenuous to suggest 
that you will increase equality by building houses that will sell for three hundred to three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I could not possibly afford that now or at any time, including the time in my life when I made the kind of living that allowed me to be a winner. It is ridiculous to say that that is an affordable house that will result in greater quality. It's not an unreasonable price for a lovely house in this neighborhood, but it will certainly not increase equality. I um, think that was a, a silly remark. Okay, well, I, this is, this I, is I Commissioner... Support. This is Commissioner Highsmith. Uh, I, I hear your criticism of my remarks. Um, I, again, I'd love if there's a neighborhood association to come and have a longer discussion about that. I think I think there's a lot of things that I could share with the group that um, would would uh, surprise you guys. Facts that would surprise you um, about the realities of these developments. Uh, I, I understand you've lived there for 27 years. I understand that you know we've we've as a commission um, and myself personally have dealt with. The issues of zoning for, for quite a while as well. We think about these every day, and we deal with a lot of items. Um, all that said, the to, you know to the individual points you made, I think you know I, I actually live in Gatewood. I live uh, on, in between 17 and, and 18th, actually on Cary Place. Uh, if you've been down Cary Place, it's easily one of the skinniest streets in the city, and it has a lot of parking on it. Um, one of the things that's very easy to notice in, in the difference between our urban streets that people park on and say a subdivision, you know, a newer subdivision that might be on the outskirts of the city, it actually comes in with the amount of parking that's allowed on the street and the size of the lanes. And I think the first immediate easy thing to notice on, on those developments on the outer ring of the city is the speed with which cars drive on those roads where they have more room so the wider you make a street, the less on-street parking that exists there, the easier it is to drive fast. Now, I understand your concern with, with turning um, from Penn onto, onto these uh, more residential streets. That is not, um, you know, we can't, as a planning commission, put those issues at the feet of somebody trying to redevelop their property. So I, I understand your issue. I think that is a great point to bring up at traffic commission where they deal directly with these issues. Um, whenever it comes to the development of a lot, while I understand the concern and keep it you know, in, in mind while making these decisions, it is not the kind of thing that I think is the fault of the redeveloper. Um, in regards to uh, you know, pricing of the project, you're right. You know, th these are going to be above market homes, but I can't imagine being able to redevelop a lot in this area for any cheaper and this is where density starts to come into play and the way that you can make your product more affordable to a you know potentially young family trying to buy into a neighborhood is to allow them to have to buy less lot and so in having a smaller lot but a market rate house you're actually spending less because you don't have to buy as much dirt to go along with your home um, again i'd love to talk about these issues at length um, so that we can all have an understanding of, of, of really how these things might impact your neighborhood better. Uh, there, it's detailed stuff. It's in the weeds. And so I really think this would need to be a longer conversation at a neighborhood meeting where I'm happy for you guys to grill me and, and yell at me all you want. And, uh, you know, we, we could have a long, robust conversation. Anyway, th hopefully that addresses some of the things that you brought up and, and provides a little bit of additional information and color that helps you with the position, at least that, I'm likely to take with this item. If I may, real quick, I want to make sure all the neighbors have uh, you know, my email address. I gave it twice. Um, so in, in terms of the past, there's been a lot of references to, to crack houses. I think it should be noted that the fact that you know, you're having a developer wanting to come in and build uh, what he's want, wanting to build, I think is a wonderful um, sentiment for where this neighborhood is and has evolved from that those days. So uh, to me, it, 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 it is a very positive. Um, I hope that everyone has my email address. If not, uh, feel, you know, reach out to staff. Staff obviously has all my points of contact and they can uh, get you uh, to me. So um, I'd be happy to meet whenever, whenever is good for the neighbors. I understand the last thing I wanna to say to you on this um, and I'm gonna shut up, I think for the rest of this item and let uh, just let the 
protesters have their you know turn to speak but um uh oh crap i'm sorry i, I lost my point <laughs> i was about to talk and i've lost my <laughs> point never mind you guys go ahead i'll have to think about that one <laughs> I still have um, Mr. Jones uh, with his hand raised. Are you with us, Mr. Jones? Did you have something you wanted to share with us? Mr. Jones, are you there? Zach? Um, it looks like Miss he uh, he exited the meeting. Okay. The, from, uh, from what I can see based on his name on the screen. And and was that all of our our uh, participants or potential participants, all the people who had signed up to speak? Yes, it looks like, uh, yes, that is correct. If I may, please. Okay. This is Pam yes. Dill. I live at 2125 Northwest 19th. And, and without belaboring the conversation, um, I agree with my, yes. my neighbors, Madeline and, yes. and Bill. One thing I would like like to, to speak more of that I don't think that has been impressed upon the commission. Our neighborhood is, is relatively small. Um, we are, we're only a couple of blocks, but one thing that we have to offer the city that you don't find necessarily close to downtown is our larger lots. Um, for our, our houses range from the turn of the century to 1940, if you will. Our lots within these couple of blocks are bigger than anybody else's. Um, and that's something that we can offer as, as the, the, the councilman suggested that we can offer to the city is, is a larger lot closer to downtown. If these lots are allowed to be divided, we start to lose part of our heritage that we, that we have and hold closely here to Las Vegas. As you can hear, some of my neighbors are, are spirited and, and, and perhaps didn't convey themselves in a way that that they should have to communicate their their desires to keep our lots as large as they are because that is special to downtown that is special to las vegas and to start dividing our lots takes that away from us and and i think that's what we really hold dear we are excited about redevelopment and and the 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 brief plan that mr box showed it, it's a wonderful design that's not the issue the issue is dividing of the lot takes away from what we have here in las vegas if you would consider that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Deal. Uh, Mrs. Deal, I do have one question. Oh, go ahead. Um, so would you be in support, uh, you know, hypothetically of an item that would retain the lot size, but instead be multifamily? Like say if it was a fourplex? No, we don't have, we don't have those either in our neighborhood. What we do have, and I think what, um, Commissioner Powell was seen from the aerial view of the map she was looking at. We have several larger homes that are of that 2000 square feet that have garage apartments in the back. And usually those are just a single apartment. Maybe there's two apartments, but, but no more than that. So you would, you would potentially support a project that contemplated a single family home on a traditional lot size there that had a, uh, an accessory dwelling unit behind but otherwise the only thing that you that that you believe matches the context of the neighborhood would be single family on the existing lot size is that correct that is correct a lot of the um apartments that i've seen that are within las vegas um and i have several for context i have i have several rental properties in the city so i'm i'm about the city quite a bit um, a lot of what we see are that those apartments are used as offices um, and things of that nature. They have not yet converted over to people using them as actual apartments where people are living. Um, we have several of those in Las Vegas, and, and I only know of one. I'm sure my neighbors that have been here longer could speak to that. I've lived here about 12 years. Well, also, to be clear, it, it sounded like, and I hope I remember his name correctly, um, Mr. Nash, who spoke earlier, 
even said that he he had purchased an existing duplex and um, revised it into a single family. So it sounds like there might have been a historic context of, of multifamily homes in this area. So it's essential. Again, I don't want to confuse the issue. We're talking about for sale product here. These are single family for sale homes that are market rate. But uh, I'm just trying to get a clear idea of uh, kind of, you know, the thoughts of the neighbors. Um, I see that Mr. Richards is still on if, if he wants to correct me, but I remember from his property, um, and again, I live on the next street over, his property was a single family home to begin with. Um, during the, the 80s and the 90s, it was converted to a duplex somewhere around in there. I don't know when. And then as, as our neighborhood has continued to grow and, and redevelop, people are coming back in and taking those out because it is no longer a value here. Well, as discussed, I'm going to stop belaboring this. I, I would like to know, I haven't heard from anybody, if uh, if the neighborhood has a neighborhood association, I would love to be invited and have a longer conversation on this at some point. We do have one. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, mister. It disbanded a couple of years ago. I, I was the president. Okay. I think we've heard um, probably as much as there is to be said on this topic. Um, does anyone want to make a motion? Oh, sorry. I, uh, <laughs> so. okay. My ward, I obviously a contested issue, but um, I, I'd really have a chance to, to have that longer conversation with the neighbors. And uh, and really impress upon them. Um, I think I think you know why the commission has, has come to the uh, view that we have in, in supporting these types of redevelopments. Uh, so I'm going to make a motion to recommend approval. Second, Commissioner Cravens. I have a motion and a second to approve item number thirteen. Would you call the roll, please? Powers. Yes. Coffee? Yes. Privet? Aye. People? Aye. Aye, Smith? Aye. Kennington? Aye. Cravens? Aye. LaForge? Yes. It's approved. Thank you. Item 14 is an application to rezone 2140 South County Line Road from R1 to PUD 1757. This is an application for a, a commercial industrial development that's located in the employment reserve land use typology. Uh, staff review recommended approval subject to six technical evaluations. Uh, technical, technical evaluation one, uh, the applicant would like to amend to allow for a 25 foot setback from the south boundary with the 10 foot buffer, uh, and we're fine with that. TE2, the applicant agrees to. TE3, we ask to eliminate loading docks and overhead doors from the southernmost, the southern face of the southernmost buildings, uh, because that area to the south is residential. Um, the applicant would like to amend that to say that there will be no loading docks or overhead doors within 150 feet of the south boundary or facing arterial streets. Um, we still have concerns about the south boundary if we're talking about semi tractor trailers in that area. Uh, technical evaluation four, the applicant agrees to that. TE5 was a list of laundry laundry list of uses that staff felt were really not appropriate for the employment reserve area. Uh, the applicant agreed to delete all of those with the exception of two. And that was 8,318 and 19. And those are the two that allow auto dealerships and truck dealerships. Uh, and we are concerned that they too do not generate the employment that the ER area envisioned. And TE6, the applicant agrees with. Uh, the applicant is David Box, and he is on the line. Yeah, so um, David Box, 
same uh, address, 522 Calcord Drive. I, I would like to ad address those handful of TEs that we'd like to uh, modify. <coughs> um, if you look at the, the area, um, could I share my screen at, at this point? Uh, it could provide some some help here. I talked to staff earlier. I think that is a an option. Zach, is that possible? Yes. Uh, give me just a second, Mr. Bonds. While you're doing that, I'd like to ask a question of uh, our staff. Uh, Mr. Chambliss, you said something about um, the concern about tractor trailers. Is there some specific way that you uh, can address that uh, other than um, that, that would be more agreeable or acceptable to both staff and the applicant? I don't know of an effective way to prohibit a tractor trailer versus a box truck from a certain okay. area of the site. Okay, just asking. I, I think on that specific issue, I think for all intents and purposes, we have done so with how we have um, set up the various use units. We've broken it into two tracks. Track one is the tract on the north. Um, the tract on the north is an I-2 base. Track two is the tract on the south, and that's an I-1 base. And it's an I-1 base then with additional uses taken out. And so I think just by its very nature, you're not likely to have those uses with heavy truck traffic and tractor trailers coming to, uh, there we go, coming to uh, that site. Um, additionally, if you drive out there, Southwest 15th is a um, more developed street, whereas uh, County Line is not. And I should be sharing my screen at this point right now. Uh, so can everybody see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So what we've done is we've broken it, like I said, in two tracks. So we've got this, this northern tract uh, and then the southern tract. The northern tract is the I-2 base yeah, it, it, surrounded by other I-2 users. You've got the landfill here. This is all industrial type of stuff, which is why it's employment reserve. Um, you know, when we zoom in, we'll see that Southwest 15th is, um, you know, a four lane major arterial and county line just simply isn't. So from a position of what it would be marketed to, you're not likely to market this to an end user that will want uh, heavy truck traffic on that Southern track. Um, so I think the lower uh, base use units, I1, and removing those uses, I think is going to solve that problem. I think the 150 foot separation is a significant separation for any overhead doors. Uh, that coupled with the fact that we'll have that 10 foot landscape buffer on the, on the Southern end of that track. I think we have accomplished what the goals were uh, in, in ensuring that you don't have those problems on that Southern line. Um, as it relates to TE number five in those two use units, we do wanna keep just those two. We're fine with removing all the other ones, but we do wanna keep those two um, I don't think that you would see this as a traditional car lot. Um, there is a, an entity that my client is talking to that is a larger scale employer. It's not your traditional car lot like you'll, you'd see on um, I-35 or Broadway Extension. Um, I, I understand the concern with staff because it's employment reserve that your typical car lot, if it located here, it would take up a lot of space and not generate that much um, employment. However, I just don't see a traditional car lot wanting to locate here. Um, those users typically cluster. They, they want to be on a highway. Uh, they don't want to be on Southwest 15th, the county line. Uh, I just can't see that that is a viable spot for a car lot anyways. So I, I think keeping those in allows us to pursue this, this end user that could be a, um, I think a wonderful user for this area, generate a lot of um, jobs uh, and keep the flexibility that we need. So the way that we have revised the TEs, I, I, I'm hopeful it gets to what staff was wanting to do, uh, but allows us to continue with flexibility in this area that is, it is a, a heavily industrialized area um, of the city, which is why it was listed in the employment reserve uh, by staff in the uh, comp plan. Mr. Box, speaking for myself, this is Commissioner Powers. Um, the the sort of practical matter um, uh, way of of dealing with concerns of they it's not likely to become a car dealership 
or they're not likely to be trailer trucks. It, it is not terribly persuasive. Um, I, the problem it, it, the, with dealerships is exactly what you're identifying. They do tend to cluster. I I grant you that at the moment this does not look like a partic- like a place where uh, I would think that a car dealership would want to be, but. The, if it allows that use, there's no telling what might happen. No, and, I, you know, the last thing in the world we'd want is for, you know, this entire frontage to turn into, um, you know, several car dealerships. It's just uh, that would not be a good use of this property at all. But, and, and I, I mean, I don't disagree. I, I wonder if there's some other way you can. I wonder if there's some other way that you can get where you need to go other than with that particular use. Um, I mean, I'm happy to work with staff on, on how to accomplish that. We can't reveal who the potential end user is, but I mean, my question would be, do we think that that use is, you know, we'll, let's just look at that use. Is that really inappropriate? I mean, is that use a use that is problematic for this area? Um, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm zooming in on these things to show yeah. you why I can't imagine why it would be uh, an inappropriate use for the area. Yeah. I mean, David's got a point. I mean, with this aerial, Obviously, you can see a whole lot of uh, uh, eighteen wheelers or Uh, freight trucks. Is there anyone else signed up to speak on this item? Commissioners, do we have any other comments or questions for the applicant? So one, uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Cravens, one question, David, how big on this uh, sort of proposed site plan that uh, Johnson Associates provided, how big are those buildings in track two purported to be? Tim or Mark, are you on the line? I see, I see J and A symbol. Tim, are you, there you go. Yep. Uh, so the large buildings along the eastern property line are 500,000 square foot buildings. Along the, so wait a minute. So what, what I'm seeing, Tim, if you can see my screen, I'll talk so I stay on. What I'm seeing is this. There's right, so a large that. building here, and then there's a set of small buildings that abut what is kind of this residential area how big are those the smaller buildings displayed on that site plan the smaller buildings are 150,000 square feet 150,000 feet okay and and uh chairman powers your concern was about trucks serving those buildings is that correct well no that was the that was the issue raised by Janice, did I lose you? I think she said that was the issue raised by staff. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm here. Okay. Did I did I understand that issue correctly? Uh, well, yeah, the, the staff was saying that they, the, the um, compromise being suggested by the applicant did not assuage their concerns about that kind of truck uh, in that area, as I understood it. Oh, yeah. A 150,000 foot building will absolutely be serviced by a semi truck. Um, there is no doubt that those buildings are going to be serviced by semi trucks. Um, having said that, I, I don't really see what the issue is here because they agreed to. Uh, oh, thank you, staff, for putting that up. Um, they agreed to move that drive 700 feet um, off of it. And they're not going to have any overhead doors in the back. I, I can't see how, uh, get, given the surrounding area, that this that that would cause any kind of a of an issue at all. Um, but those buildings will be served by semi trucks. There's no question about it. Yeah, and we 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 believe that to be the case. Our point okay. is with the setback and then no south facing doors uh, within yeah. 150 feet of that south line. I think we've eased whatever the concern would be right well you don't have outside storage either and you don't have enough space there i mean 
you know, maybe that's the thing. If, if, if that's the issue, maybe what we need to do is restrict so much footage on the south side of the property for also for truck parking. Because what you wouldn't want to do, what the real concern with sites like this is, is that a lot of times these trucks come on site and they'll park for, you know, a day or two or three or more at a time, depending on what they're loading and unloading from a distribution perspective. So maybe what you do, if it's, if it's trying to create a, an amicable agreement here is restrict the, the parking of those trucks, you know, somewhere from the South boundary up uh, the way they've got it on a site plan, trucks couldn't park there anyway, because the buildings are so far South, but this is just a proposed site plan. It's not a, not a built product. So. Yeah, David, can I uh, can I ask you to clarify? Uh, it was my understanding. Uh, maybe I understood your modification to TE three a little bit differently. Are you are you saying that there wouldn't be doors on the south side of these buildings? This within is Jeff. A, within one hundred and fifty feet. So okay. again, yeah, because this is a schematic, right? So what we're what we're saying is that if there's a south facing door, it wouldn't be within the first hundred and fifty feet, and yeah we agree on the total prohibition on the overhead doors facing the arterial. Okay. Well, so, the, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say is just for the benefit of the commission, our, our concern was just, you know, how, the question is how much space is enough space because if, if you've got the semis that are, that are backing into these docks, you know, you've got the noise of them pulling in and out, uh, their engines running and stuff like that for the, for the single family homes. So it's really just a question in our minds of how you know, what that appropriate distance would be. As I look at this site plan, and, and I agree with Commissioner Cravens, of course, it's not, we're not, you know, approving the site plan today, but there are these, these streets between the buildings on the far west side that go out onto, or drives that go out onto County Line Road. So even though there may not be any loading dock across the back, that is the county line road side of those buildings, the side nearest those residential uses, if trucks pull down that way and for some reason would you know, park or access those buildings through side doors, that would be almost as noisy and uh, obnoxious to those um, properties there on the uh, west side of County Line Road. Uh, I, I think there might be, you know, an easy solution to that if, as Commissioner Cravens was uh, suggesting, that that, that kind of um, traffic or access be limited in some way uh, to a certain number of feet north of that southern boundary. Uh, limited to, I should say, limited from, um, you know, a certain number of feet from that southern boundary, a number of feet that would correspond with the residential development to the west. And and Commissioner Powers, you're talking about the 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 existing development. Um, you know what? One of the things that concerns me as you look at the surrounding zoning to the west is that you've. I mean, th this line is where the heavy industrial overlay for Southwest Oklahoma City, county line is kind of where it ends. And you have this real transitional area where Mustang has sort of grown over from the east, but you've got this, you know, the Hobby Lobby campus and all that stuff just south of this. And um, I mean, so this is kind of the end of the road for industrial. So on the west side of the road, I don't know what the floodplains or the construction looks like, but one of the things that would concern me is that this gets zoned and you've got this residential area, this agricultural area that somebody may come in and rezone as residential, right? Which could be, wind up being built first. And now you've got even more residential conflict between the industrial and the residential. And I, I love me some industrial property um, for sure, but the way they've got the, the site designed, I, I think this, these buffer parcels, I'm not sure uh, David or Tim, probably David, what, what are these parcels that are, that are just shown in green that are smaller parcels that run along the western and northern edge? What are those? Tim? Yeah, those were set up because you get a big user like this, a big industrial user. They bring in uh, smaller users like truck repair, like fast food, like 
uh, uses that would be uh, needed to service uh, the trucking industry that will be utilizing these warehouses. Uh, and so that's what those are set up for. Uh, the green strip on the east and very southeast corner, that is a, uh, there's no floodplain, but it is a blue line. It's a Corps of Engineers blue line. So we're staying out of that. Yeah, I, I see it on your drawing and, and um, the way you got it. I, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, step on uh, Commissioner Coffey's toes or, you know, delay you unnecessarily. I, I think there's probably, at least for me, a, a a right way to, to uh, get this done. I think it take may take some more conversation. Would you guys, I didn't really anticipate this and I'm so sorry that I didn't mention it in advance, but listening to the discussion, would you guys mind taking two weeks on this one and maybe Commissioner Coffey and I and you guys can work together to, to try to button this up a little bit and let it go forward, but in a way that's really respectful of the fact that this county line road is, is really kind of a dividing line? Hold on one sec, yeah. Um, we can do two weeks. My client just texted me. If, if I could, before, before we do that, and which I think is a great idea, I'm all in favor of it. As I'm looking at this, I'm almost wondering whether if the site were flipped, the buildings were, you know, just mirror image of, of what they are, whether that might even be a better solution. And I was going to ask Commissioner Privet, this reminds me a lot of the, the industrial uh, development that kind of abuts your neighborhood and I was wondering if you might want to contribute your thoughts also to the layout here or the the limitations uh, I, I agree that that of course if you're talking about fast food restaurants I guess those would not be a very good use along that east boundary but um, it, the larger buildings almost seem to me like they would provide better buffering if that makes sense if those if those loading docks and the traffic was not on that west side of them so my two cents worth mike you um, might choose you might choose to contribute your thoughts as this moves forward i yeah, think I, um two weeks is a great idea yeah um the way it works Motion. at this one here <laughs> most of the trucks are kind of on the interior and they don't really go on the exterior too much the only problem we've had was them maybe uh, taking a wrong turn and coming into the neighborhood and getting stuck trying to get out of the neighborhood. Um, signage would help that, but it's not going to keep it from happening. Maybe restrict access from trucks on the west side where those uh, houses are. Well, we'll, is... we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll figure something out. Okay. Uh, clarify that uh, the land to the west, the undeveloped land to the west, is designated um, employment reserve by the comprehensive plan. So the the um, just that existing development to the south, uh, kind of on the across the street from uh, track two, the southern track, that would be uh, affected. I'm most concerned about the residents on the south side of, uh, of track one. Uh, I'd like for us to give that some more thought. In, in, in the nature of um, making sure we have, is, are there any other concerns from commissioners that uh, Commissioner Coffey and I can take to our discussions with the applicant that anybody else has? I'm perfectly willing to leave it in your capable hands. I will say, um, uh, unrelated to the item, I am enjoying uh, Commissioner Privet's backgrounds, and I hope this is an ongoing bit. Can I get a motion on the continuance, please? I move continuance of this item until uh, what's our first meeting in May? May the 14th, Mary. May the 14th. I'll second. second. I have a motion and a second to continue item number 14 yep. until May the 14th. Would you call the roll, please? Powers? Yes. Coffee? Yeah.
Harry. Yes. Privet. Aye. Pinkle. Aye. Tyson. Aye. Pennington. Aye. Craven. Aye. LaForge. Yes. Approved. An application to operate a mining mill raw materials use in the AA district, 10420 Northeast 122nd Street. This is a continuation of the case that you heard at your last meeting. Uh, it was continued in order for the applicant and the protester to uh, get together. I uh, know they've had conversation, and both Mr. Box and Mr. Murphy are on the line. Uh, yeah, so David Box 522 Call Court Drive. Um, my understanding is that Mr. Murray is going to be here to tell you that he is no longer in protest. Um, so if I may, Madam Chair, can I wait and hear what Mr. Murray says before I give any comments? You certainly can. Okay. Mr. Murray, did you have something you wanted to say to us? Mr. Murray, are you there? Uh, well, I, I can share that he sent an email to myself and Commissioner Pennington um, not long before the start of the meeting withdrawing his protest. I don't know that he included staff, but um, I see uh, Mr. Pennington nodding in agreement. So my understanding is um, he is no longer in protest of this item. And he is not on the call that I can tell. This is Zach and public information. Ah, okay. So, okay, if he's not on the line, so this is a mining operation. Um, it'll be a sand mining operation. It'll be a a, uh, a dredging operation. It is worth noting, if you see on the aerial, there are um, several other mining operations in close proximity, which is not surprising that it's on the river. That's where they mine sand and, and other minerals. Um, you know, we, we are very regulated through not just the city, through the entitlements, but also we have to go uh, through the Department of Mines, Department of Environmental Quality, um, you know, all of which we will be working through, um, through the extent of this um, operation. So, um, you know, we were able to talk to Mr. Murray, kind of walk through what it is we're doing. Ultimately, I think um, my client and him came to an agreement, um, and that is why he is no longer in protest. So we would ask for your approval, and there are no technical evaluations. Commissioners, do we have any questions or comments for our applicants? I hear a very, very faint voice. It sounds like it's way off in the distance. Does anybody, ha I can't make out what they're saying. Does anybody have any idea about what that is? It's, it sounds like somebody's got TV on in the background. Okay. Um, let me just ask, is there anybody else who wishes to be heard on this item? If not, I'll take a motion. This is Commissioner Pennington. I want to first say thank you to David for really working with Mr. Murray. There was, it was a it was a extensive process, uh, but we reached very uh, good resolution. And I just want to commend him for the work on that. Um, with that, I move approval of item fifteen. Do 
I have a second? Second. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve item number 15. Would you call the roll, please? Powers? Yes. Coffee? Yes. Privet? Aye. Pinkle? Aye. Eisner? Aye. Kennington? Aye. Ravens? Aye. Before? Yes. Thank you. It's approved. The final item, item 16, is consideration of proposed map comprehensive plan changing all the area and that's located. I can barely hear you. You're really glitching in your audio there for me at least. All right, I'll uh, I'll scoot up. Is that better? Much better. Okay. Um, it's located south of uh, excuse me, get on the right one, north of West Memorial Road and east of Morgan Road. Uh, Susan, Susan Atkinson uh, from the planning staff is going to give us a, a summary. Uh, yes, commissioners, good afternoon. Susan Atkinson, senior planner with the planning department. Um, this is, I will preface this presentation very brief uh, by saying that this is a little bit of an academic exercise for us. Ms. Atkinson, I cannot hear you. I think if you scoot up closer to the mic, Susan, you'd, you'd be fine. Okay. Is the mic part of the camera? Yes. Okay, can you hear me better now? Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks for the feedback. This is my first video meeting of a dis deliberative body. <laughs> um, this is a bit of an academic exercise because this item has already uh, proceeded to city council and was given approval but the applicant requested that we come back to the planning commission. We admit, uh, there was a, um, a noticing error back in January that didn't allow the item, the CPA item to be heard with the zoning question. So you all approved the zoning and the applicant proceeded to counsel with the item. So just to make sure everybody's really clear on that. Um, I'm going to share my screen uh, let's see if I can do that successfully. Okay, um, Zach, can you enable me to share my screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Okay. Can everybody see that? We see you. You see me? Okay, but you're not seeing the screen. Hold on, Susan, just a second, please. Okay. While Zach is trying to pull that up, um, I, I'll remind the commission that when we, uh, when staff recommends approval for comp plan amendments, we have three basic criteria that we consider. One is the provision of um, water. Another is the provision of sewer. And the third is the uh, ability to provide emergency services, specifically fire suppression. Susan, um, Su Susan, you can now share your screen. Okay. Um, it, let's see. Let me close this. Uh, let's see. Do not work. Okay. I am having a technical problem because <laughs> I've got the presentation up in front of me. Let me see if I can go back to, all right. Let's try that. Here you go, Susan, okay. I, I put it up on my screen for you. Thank you, Zach, perfect. That's really what we need to talk about. As I was saying, we have three criteria for recommending a, uh, approval of a change to the comp comprehensive plan. This particular uh, case, um, the applicant is providing water and sewer. Those are going to be available and service the site. But as you can see, the fuchsia outline um, in, exists in the longer than rural response time target for fire. So um, we looked at this a lot of different ways and we cannot change our recommendation uh, to, to support approving this 
this proposed land use change, precisely because, as you can see from the shared image, um, the, the subject parcel exists in that area of Oklahoma City that is, uh, has longer than rural response time for fire. So that really does lead us to our conclusion, which is in spite of this being a kind of academic discussion, we are still recommending denial on the request to change the comp plan amendment. So rather than belabor the point, I will try to answer any questions uh, you may have. Jeff Butler is also here, so he can answer questions. You know, I, I guess I feel compelled given that presentation um, to ask, the, the staff report recommends denial, um, but you know, your, your suggestion that this is really, um, what did you say, an, an academic exercise um, makes me ask, you know, how serious the staff is about their position on this. Um, I think these lines are, it's important to draw them and stand behind them if they um, mean anything. If they don't, then, you know, I think we need to know that. Well, yeah, the, the, the academic exercise, it, the reason uh, for that is it's just that it's, the, the zoning has already been approved. Um, that's, that's really simply the reason for that comment. And the zoning has been approved. So, um, this is just changing the map. And uh, no matter what we do with this action, uh, the developer can move forward with their planned project. What would be the outcome? Uh, I mean, is it, I, I would assume no outcome really, it would just be non-conforming to the comp plan. If we, if we denied the comp plan amendment, but allowed for the rezone, is that, is that a thing? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's strange. Um, and, and to answer Jan, your question further, uh, yes, we do, we do put a lot of stock in these, uh, in these analyses. So it's not that we're, uh, not confident in the analyses. We certainly are. And we've worked with fire and, uh, are confident in, in, in that, in, in the plan itself. Uh, it's just that it's a strange situation because as Susan said, you know, this wasn't able to go forward with, um, the zoning item itself. Uh, and then there was a, another continuance uh, for some reason further along the line that, that even further delayed it uh, until, until after the city council took their action. <clears throat> um, Jeff, I, I've, I've got a question in regards to these kinds of items, because I, I really feel with, uh, you know, since we've seen a, a couple of these at least um, recently that we're likely to see more. Uh, and we had an extensive conversation on fire response times and and residential suppression. And it was obvious that a lot of people, you know, felt like it was a serious issue and none of us are thrilled about making the decision on these spuds because of the, you know, I, I guess what I'm getting at is, is there any way that we could impress upon city council um, as a commission to address the potential concerns. I mean, maybe they're they're addressing it as just to say we already have we've approved the building code as as it is. But I, I just wonder if if city council really understands the uh, you know I, I'd I'd like them to hear at least or understand the conversation that we've had as a commission to make sure that they're you know that our concerns are their concerns maybe. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll tell you that we, um, so since the last commission meeting um, where, you know, that uh, th this similar issue was discussed at length, uh, we've met with the fire department, uh, with fire marshal's office, and uh, they're going to have kind of deliberations internally uh, because, you know, the, some good points were brought up last time um, about, you know, well, what's, what's the right thing to do? Um, if we were to go forward and, you know, is, is the right thing to do to approach the city council about a code change uh, that would that would maybe uh, require development um, in these red zones. 
these longer than rural response time areas to to sprinkle and if so would that be appropriate to require all development even if it's already been platted or just would it only apply to uh, new zoning cases as far as uh, when we originally talked to the, the, the fire chief a few months back um, in response to this case there's this, that was really in relation to um, whether or not it was appropriate to bring something uh, this property into urban low because the planning commission obviously that's you know when you're talking about what the right time to develop is that's the planning commission's purview do we have the services is this the right time to entitle this for development or does it need to wait or somewhere in between whereas last meeting uh it was something that was already zoned it was it was urban low already it had already uh so that, that it really was a separate issue it was just the plat and and is it appropriate to to require somebody to do something they weren't aware of uh when they when they originally zoned the property. So they're, they're two separate issues. Um, and we were working with the fire department to kind of talk through that. Um, so there, there's, there's more to come uh, as far as that discussion goes. And we talked about the building code and the different versions that are um, coming forth. They, they're, they're going to start very soon, uh, the process of, of, and if Mike's on the line, he can, he can correct me if I make an error here, but. Uh, going through and, and potentially adopting the 2018 code. So it, it may be an opportune uh, time to do this, although it, it will take some time. Um, Jeff or Mike or both, um, how often are these fire response maps updated? I mean, is there a, a procedure like a new fire station goes in and we do a new study and then, or is it, you know, just. Yeah, we, we will, um, it's rare. You know, every few years the fire station uh, will get built. There, there are a couple new ones that were that were done in the last bond. But every time um, we update the comp plan or there's a new fire station built, uh, we'll update the the maps. Okay, and I guess also too was, do we know you know if this data is affected by the turnpike that is in there now, or you know was it was that in consideration to response times? Yeah, everything, uh, this, this, this map is, is uh, it, it reflects everything that's on the ground now. Okay. I, I will make a totally qualitative comment here in that I, I do think as a, uh, as a pressure to continue densifying closer to the core that utilizing response times is a great, is a great way to kind of create that development pressure so that, um, you know, we adhere to the concepts of, of plan OKC. Um, I don't know that staff has that many tools at their disposal to incentivize development towards the core. And this seems like one of them. It seems like to me, really adhering to this, to response times and what they mean currently within um, the way that we view redevelopment is a great thing to hang our hat on to kind of uh, um, again incentivize the types of development that I think we tend to all agree on as a commission. Asa, I would just add to your comment about whether or not those conversations have been relayed. I I'll tell you because it had come up twice in such a short period of time. I, I mean, I took the step and I would encourage each of you all was planning commission to do the same. I contacted um, Mark Stonecipher and had a discussion with him about what had unfolded in our last meeting and in the one before. And as Jeff pointed out appropriately, there are two very separate issues that we we faced in a very close proximity to one another, but they're two very different issues. One was a zoning and one was a platting issue. Um, and I took the time to explain that to him and made sure that he had, you know, kind of the, the gist of our concerns um, that had been addressed and then where it was going. So I, I did that for that very reason because I thought it had risen to the level that I wanted to make sure that they, they were aware of what was going on. So, uh, Same, actually. I, I had the same conversation. So, yeah, agreed. Good. Okay, where are we? Well, it's Ward 8, so, I mean, I, 
if there is some value in staff's mind of preserving the comp plan amendment is not being changed, like we would be creating some precedent that, you know, um, would, would make it harder to, to defend, assuming that ordinance could go a different direction. I don't have a strong opinion about this, frankly, one way or the other, because uh, what should have happened, uh, in my view here, happened, and, and this is more of, um, about uh, the comp plan itself, not about uh, whether or not the property should be zoned or what's right or appropriate for development. I, I just think it's two separate issues. Um, so I, I don't have any objection. In fact, I think we're almost doing maybe staff a, a favor um, by, su by supporting their recommendation uh, to deny it, uh, as it is the only way we can sort of send a signal from our seats that um, there is an issue here we're talking about, and it, maybe it helps spur council on to provide some further guidance here, um, which is what I requested from, from Mark in terms of um, what I thought, you know, uh, we, we needed. So uh, if, unless anybody has a strong opinion either way, uh, and wants to speak up about it, I'm prepared to make a motion to support staff recommendation here. I, I agree. Madam Chair. I might have been on. Madam yes. Chair, uh, yes. Let, me, let me point out that the applicant's engineer, Kendall Dillon, should be on the line. He may wish to speak about this. Commissioner Powers, this is Kendall Dillon with Craft and Toll. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. All right. Um, I actually, I do have an opinion. I'd, I'd like to see that it gets approved. Um, obviously, does it have an impact on um, whether or not we can develop it or not? Um, I don't, you know, I, I assume it doesn't, but, um, you know, I, still we've made the application. We put in the effort and the work and we'd like to follow through with it. Um, I'm not exactly sure if there's some details left out there that may affect it down the road. Um, again, it, you know, we, even though this was set to be a companion item and, and um, obviously because of the noticing error and some other events is just now getting before you, um, you know, we did have a lengthy discussion at that time um, specifically about the comp plan. And I'm sitting here looking at a, uh, an exhibit that I have, if you all care for me to share my screen. But if you look at this general area, um, I'm saying I'm looking at more than 25 developments in this area that are ongoing developments that all fall beyond that urban response time. And when I look at this site, um, there's just not anything to me that differentiates it. Um, so I think if you look at that, not only on the east side, um, we have we're joined by an approved development as well as on the west. Um, we have Urban Low on the south, the Memorial. So if you look at those things in conjunction with the fact that there's actually already been a comp plan amendment um, that was approved on north of 150th on the west side of county line, um, you know, we would like to see that the comp plan is amended um, to match our zoning. And um, that way we don't have any hidden pitfalls out there that, that may come to be an issue later on down the line. So that's our opinion. Um, so we appreciate your decision, uh, but we'd ask for that you'd approve the comp plan amendment. Uh, Kendall, I'm gonna jump in here a second. Um, I, I, I respect what you're saying. I think this doesn't affect your development in any way. Um, and my, um, opinion wouldn't, I, it, it wouldn't change for anybody else who's previously been zoned, who's sitting out there with a plat. I, I'll have this argument as many times as is necessary in an effort to um, help these things that, that have been in the works get, get through. That said, I think to staff's point, this is one of the few, the few ways we actually have to say to public and the development community right now that for forthcoming applications, this is something that is that that is unsettled. And it's also the way we can indicate that to city council, that this is an unsettled issue. People have often come in and use these comp plan amendments as sort of the, the doormat for rezoning applications adjacent and so forth. Um, if there are applications that have been zoned and plats come up I cannot speak for the Planning Commission or any of its members except for myself. I will certainly advocate for those folks um, for their applications to be approved. But as it relates to the comp plan amendment, this is purely within our purview as a Planning Commission 
and it says, look, there are development issues here that we need to make people aware of. And this is our only way to do that. Um, your application going through, in my view, was the right thing. City Council agreed with that. Um, there's going to be a lot more discussion on this, I think, as you well know. Uh, but I think recommending denial of the comp plan change and supporting that recommendation from staff, it makes a lot of sense here. It, it, it just, it's, it's, it's the only weapon we've got, man. Um, and, and, you know, what's right is right. I think what happened with you, what happened there was right. Um, and, but I think this is right too. And I don't know what else to do. It seems a little weird to, you know, to recommend denial uh, on the comp plan amendment, um, having supported your application diligently. Um, but I, I think that's, I think it's the right call. So um, I'm hoping these conversations are going to continue. I, I, and I, I think, I think that enough um, doors are getting rattled that, that they will. So hopefully we'll get a resolution of this soon by council speaking in the form of an ordinance. That's what we really need to happen. So right. uh, I appreciate your position. In I appreciate the comments. I understand. I just like to say on behalf of the applicant, I just wanted to make sure that uh, we have an opportunity to ask for approval, but I understand your consideration and appreciate it. Uh, Madam Chair, is anyone else who wants to be heard on this? Any other commissioners I, want to be I, heard on this? I thought I had asked that already. Is there anyone else who wishes to be heard on this item? If not, I'll take a motion. Okay. Uh, if there's no further discussion on the item, uh, I will uh, make a recommendation to deny the comp plan amendment as recommended by staff for CPA 2019-0006. Second. I have a motion and a second to deny item number 16. Would you call the roll please? Powers. So if I vote yes, that's to deny the plan, to deny the, the, um, <laughs> right? Uh, so yes. Yes, Madam Chair. Poppy. Yes. Privets. Aye. People. Aye. 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 Pennington. Aye. Ravens. Aye. LaForge. Yes. <clears throat> Denied. The last two items on the agenda have been continued. So that, that disposes of our items to be heard. Um, I, I want to thank staff, especially for that uh, presentation. Um, and we'll proceed with additional items of which I'm not aware that there are any communications and reports, planning commission committees of which there are none, planning commission members. And I'll go first to thank staff so very, very much for their help in setting up this uh, video conference. Uh, Francis Kersey, who uh, the um, city clerk was so, so helpful. Uh, Mickey Graham and Zach Nash, you just, uh, we definitely would not have been able to pull this off with you. But staff generally, you know, uh, Cindy Lakin and, and uh, Dan Brummett, who gave me some advice about various things as we were moving forward here. Uh, and, but of course, Susan Randall as well, JJ, Jeff Butler, um, and, and all of you who are, have kind of guided us through this. Thank you so much. I know this must be such an extra burden and uh, an extra heap of work for you, but we really appreciate it so very, very much. Anyone else? I, I just echo that. Thanks, thanks staff for everybody put this together and um, thanks Janice for guiding us through this. This, is a, this is, was a weird meeting. Privet's backgrounds made it even more weird, so. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? My audio is so glitchy. I can't tell whether anybody else is trying to speak. Let me just go straight to planning department. Yeah. Um, 
Commissioner Cravens, it sounds like a challenge. Uh, I'll work on my background as well for next week. Um, but we, <laughs> we have, uh, just wanted to give you a, uh, a brief update. So the for the code update, um, we the, the mayor the mayor has selected a group of people that he would like to invite to be uh, the stakeholder advisory team. Great news. Uh, the COVID-19 slowed us down there, but uh, uh, he's got that to get together and uh, the invitation should be going out any day now. Uh, so I'll follow up with that and uh, kind of keep you guys posted. Obviously some planning commissioners will be on that. Um, the other thing uh, to report is that we have begun uh, focus groups uh, for the sign code. Uh, those will be taking place over the next several days. Uh, we've met with a couple of council members and our consultant to kind of take their temperature on the billboard issue. Uh, we'll be getting with, uh, with, with you all and the stakeholder advisory team as, uh, as they get uh, seated. Um, so that's, that's kind of uh, what's going on there. We're happy that things are uh, starting to, to move after a long pause. Yeah, that is good news. It's very good news. Development Services Department. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Nothing from us. <laughs> Municipal Counselor's Office. Nothing. Citizens to be heard. Have I got anybody left out there? Other business, which I've never known what that means. Adjournment. I'll take a motion to adjourn. Go move. Okay. Very good. And a, call the roll, please. Powers. Powers. I, I thought you called my name, so I'll say yes. Coffee? Yes. Privet? Aye. Tinkle? Aye. Pye Smith? Aye. Pennington? Aye. Ravens? Tiger King is a new low, Privet. Yeah. Aye. <laughs> the Forge? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all so, so, so much. Stay safe. Have a great Stay weekend. Until I see you all.